Today on the Agile India podcast, Sean and I are going to be talking about this concept of firm fixed price contracts. So, the road to waterfall is paved with good intentions, right? How do we arrive at waterfall? It's through the natural reaction to things going wrong. Okay, so I, I, that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm thinking of when I worked at a company that we invented, essentially invented requirement specifications, it was a direct result of quality issues. So the idea came where uh, if if you, the later in a process you discover you're wrong, the more expensive it is, right? So logically, you should do more investigation early to eliminate those problems before you waste time building stuff. Because once you've built it, you've spent that money. You want to find you want to find out you're wrong early. And the way you do that is through uh, discussion and documentation of the discussions that you've had. That makes sense. Right. So something goes wrong and we, what do we do? We add a process. Right. We add more documentation. We try to spend more time making sure we're right to make sure we never go, we never go wrong again. You know, let's do root cause analysis and let's prevent us from being wrong. Right. But what does that do? What's the consequences of that? What are the second and third order effects of trying to not be wrong? So what do we do? We add these things, these documents and requirements and upfront thinking and stage gates. And what happens? And I think too often we tend to hold on to this concept of, of a firm fixed price contract as something that we have a hard time letting go of. And I don't necessarily mean a physical contract that we're signing with an external customer. I mean these forms of, in, it might be an internal contract between, and, and, and you can hear the language when we talk about commitments and accountability. It's, uh, what's, the, what's the purpose of a contract? What's the fundamental purpose of, uh, of a firm fixed price contract? when something doesn't go according to plan, uh, who eats the cost? Right. It is a risk transference mechanism. It says when things don't go right, I, the, the burden of that responsibility, the, the risk is burdened by one of the parties, and it's predefined in such a way that now I have, I'm the customer. I don't trust my supplier. I don't trust the motivation of my supplier. I don't trust that they're not going to fleece me. Therefore, I'm going to write it in such a way that if they don't perform, it is on them. It is their responsibility. They are burdening the risk. Okay, and then if I'm the supplier, I'm now incentivized to make sure everything is documented to an excruciating detail because I don't want to be held responsible when we get to the end and they're saying, well, that's not what I wanted you to build. I, in fact, I want it to be specified to a degree so that there's no ambiguity about what I'm agreeing to build for you. At the end of the day, I need to cover my butt. Yeah, I need to be able to go back and say, no, look, I built exactly what you asked for. So it, the Stephen Covey in his, his book, the, the Speed of Trust, kind of talks about this trust tax. And so by insisting on a uh, firm, first, firm fixed price contract, what are the second and third order effects of that? Now, the supplier needs to have a firm specification of what you want, right? And that takes time, and it takes being right, and it means that we've now front-loaded a lot of the work, and we've trying to tra- in attempts to try to transfer the risk. So I, one thing I, I, I've heard a lot is the debate over, is that a bug, or is that a story? Is this probably something you've heard? Yep. And I I think this is a result of this type of risk transference, because as a developer, if you come to me and say, well, this is a bug, and I don't want to be responsible for not meeting my commitments, I might say, well, no, no, that's that's not what we agreed to. Um, That's actually a new story. What I'm trying to do is force the responsibility back onto the business and and sort of deflect the, the responsibility, because I'm... What I'm, what I'm engaged in is meeting my commitment, not in producing a product that's really solving the end customer's needs. Yeah, so let's think about for a moment how much time and effort and mental energy is spent trying to either c- 
cover our own butts or transfer risk or transfer responsibility or make sure that if something goes wrong, the appropriate person is to blame, right? Well, it's not me as the developer. I was following instructions. Well, it's not me as the business because the developers didn't meet their commitments. And, and all, of this, uh, all of this paperwork and paper trail to try and prove that, that is, that is, as Stephen Covey puts it, the speed of trust. So if we're talking about firm fixed price contracts, what's an alternative way of, of getting work done? The alternative way is time and materials. I can either contract out things as a firm fixed price or I can get a time and materials contract and I say, spill me for the number of hours that you work. Why would I choose, why would I not choose that? If I have a mental model that people are not intrinsically motivated, then I might believe that in that model, people are just going to sit in their hands because they're getting paid already. You're going to get fleeced, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I, it, it doesn't matter how long they take because they've got no interest in, in getting things done fast. But why do we accept that in certain cases? My lawyer charges me by the hour. Well, you trust your lawyer. You believe that they have a level of professionalism. Like, in fact, their profession requires them to behave ethically. My accountant, the same way, they, I get charged by the hour. So why, why are software developers different? Now, I, I believe that this is often a trained behavior. It could be that somebody has spent a great deal of time in their career interacting with developers who have not instilled them with trust. Maybe I've been burned. Maybe I've tried to extend trust before and it's gone poorly and, and I've, I've felt the brunt of that. So how do you develop a trusting relationship? That is a good question. I think one thing that we need to start with is the clarity around that the relationship we want to have is that of a time and materials it, it, don't even try, don't even start with agile. Don't even get out the door with trying to say you're trying to be agile until you can get to that point of saying this is going to be a time and materials relationship. So, so what would be some smells if you were listening to the language uh, a team is using or a product owner is using that would lead you to believe that they are using a uh, firm fixed price contract as a mindset around their work? There's all types of language that we use that basically imply a risk transference where we are not co-equal partners in a venture with a business and development team and we are engaging in a risky enterprise because it is only through this risk that we actually generate value. But it's a, I am now pushing, the res if something goes wrong, I'm pushing the responsibility to you. So what are, what are some of these words like you say? Commitment is one. And how, how do we use that? Have you met your iteration commitments? Have you met your iteration commitments? Did you get that done on time? Yeah. Estimates versus actuals. You're on the hook for that? Who's, whose head's going to roll? In fact, this is a very violent language. Even the word deadline is a very violent language around this. Yeah, you cross the, if you don't cross this line, you're dead. <laughs> and so, there, yeah, you're right. There's all this, this violent... Uh, violent language that we use to try and convey the fact that something is important. And why does that matter? Why do we need that? Well, I think, I think language communicates values. So when people hear that type of language, it's going to, it's going to motivate their behaviors. It's going to incentivize certain behaviors. So, so one of the things, one of the behaviors we want to incentivize is transparency of information. So if we have a firm fixed price contract, I am not incentivized to share with you all of the information. If I have new, new information arises, it's gonna make something take longer. I may actually hide that information from you. I'll, you know, I'll figure out a way to get it done. Right, the, the deadline's immoving, immovable. It's on my head, so why on earth would I share things going wrong because it's just going to come back and say, well, it's on, you know, it, it's on your head to, to solve them. So we, 
then we place our hopes and our dreams on, well, you know, maybe we'll have a miracle and maybe we'll just work some extra overtime in the end. And therefore, we ignore information that's available to us. In fact, I, I think we even avoid seeking out that information. You know, one of the things that uh, Scrum and other methodologies encourage is getting customer feedback, right? But if customer feedback is going to change the requirements, I don't want to go seek that information out. Right, you know, oh, that's great that they want a new user story, but we still have to meet our deadline. And and the, that's not what I agreed to. That's not what I. Yeah, yeah. that's not what I agreed to. So it, here's my point: is yeah, if if you're not willing to engage with your developers on a time and materials basis, then don't pass go. Right? Don't pretend that you're agile because you're doing a process. Because fundamentally, you don't. You have not built a. Either you have not built a project around motivated people or you have and you don't actually trust that motivation and you're trying to use fear as a mechanism. And risk transference is, a, I believe, a fear-based motivational tool. So this is my mental model of this relationship we can have with development teams. That risk is, there, let's acknowledge risk. It exists. We are not a we are not a manufacturing line. We are building, everything we build is something that has never been built before because that's where it derives its value from. We do not know exactly how to build it going in because that's what we're getting paid for is to figure that out. And there is inherently risk in that, but let's share that as a team. The business side, development side, let's acknowledge it, share it, and then use information and incentivize this flow of this transparency of information as we go through because we can use that to our advantage. Thanks for joining us today on the Agile India podcast. We're your hosts, Chris Edwards and Sean Dunn. Agile India is Asia's premier conference on agile and lean methods. You can join us in Bangalore, March 6th to 10th. We hope to see you there.